Good morning and welcome to our online all age service. This morning, as you can see, I am coming to you from St. Andrew's Church in Buckland Monocorum. And of course, we continue to look forward to the time where we can meet together in this church building and indeed the Church of the Holy Spirit in Milton Coombe as well. You might have heard in the news this past week that churches are now able to open four services. But with that in mind, there are a number of stipulations that we need to meet and guidelines uh, that we need to follow. And so we're hopeful that in the coming weeks we'll be able to open again. And indeed, we have uh, Sunday the 19th of July as our own uh, Super Sunday, if you like, where we'll be hosting uh, a spoken word communion service here at St. Andrews. And warmly invite any who would like to to come and join us for that. The pattern looking on beyond that is yet to be decided. Uh, things will look very different for a time, but uh, I hope that we'll be patient with one another, gracious towards one another, that we'd seek God's wisdom in all of this, and ultimately that the Lord Jesus would be praised and glorified. Well, this morning is uh, our all-age service. We are beginning a little series in the book of Jonah. As we begin, let's pray, and I'd invite you to join in with the responses. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, God's grace and mercies are new every morning. And as Christians, we have so much to be thankful for, even in the difficult moments and the frustrating times of life. We're going to begin by singing a great song together that reminds us that our job, our calling, is to lift God's name on high, to give thanks for all that he's done, and to praise his name for the Lord Jesus. This song does have action, so uh, if you're watching this in the morning and you need to get up and stretch a little bit uh, and do some exercises as you enjoy the song, then please do join in if you'd like to. But let's sing together now. I lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth came to save us you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky Lord I lift your name on high you came from heaven to earth Here are a few book titles at the bottom of the screen. Perhaps they're familiar to you. Maybe you've read them, or if you're still learning to read, 
perhaps someone has read them to you. The Highway Rat, Alex Ryder, Stormbreaker, uh, Audrey, Her Real Story, uh, I Dare You, Tracy Beaker, and Michael Jordan, The Life. Most of the time, as you'd expect with book titles like this, the main focus is the named person on the front cover. They are the main character, the main man or the main woman. Well, as we've already heard over these next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Jonah from the Bible. And although it's called Jonah, the main focus isn't the prophets himself, but God. God is the main focus. And so it's God we're going to be learning about first and foremost, who he is, uh, what he's like, uh, and so on. Now, of course, we will learn about Jonah too, and the other characters in this story. And we know, don't we, uh, the story of Jonah, because it's a famous one. If you were to ask the average person in the street to name one Bible story, if they could do that, well, they might mention the Christmas story. They might possibly mention Easter. But some of the most famous stories are things like David and Goliath or Daniel and the lion's den or Jonah and that great big fish. We hear about Jonah in school assemblies. We learn about him at Sunday school, uh, maybe in RE lessons too. And if there's one thing we're familiar with, it is this great big fish. But there is so much more going on in this wonderful book. This morning, we're going to take our time just to look at chapter one. And as we come to the Bible, as we come to think about God's word, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, which is unchanging and is true. As we come to look at your word this morning, would you by your spirit be our teacher, that you might change us and help us to be more like Jesus. Amen. So, Jonah chapter 1. The Lord spoke his word to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. I see the evil things they do. But Jonah got up to run away from the Lord. He went to the city of Joppa. There he found a ship that was going to the city of Tarshish. Jonah paid for the trip and went aboard. He wanted to go to Tarshish to run away from the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. The wind made the sea very rough. So the ship was in danger of breaking apart. The sailors were afraid. Each man cried to his own God. The men began throwing the cargo into the sea. This would make the ship lighter so it would not sink. But Jonah had gone down into the ship to lie down. He fell fast asleep. The captain of the ship came and said, Why are you sleeping? Get up, pray to your God. Maybe your God will pay attention to us. Maybe he will save us. Then the men said to each other, Let's throw lots to see who cast the, these troubles to happen to us. So the men threw lots. The lot showed that the trouble had happened because of Jonah. Then the men said to Jonah, Tell us what you have done. Why has this terrible thing happened to us? What is your job? Where do you come from? What is your country? Who are your people? Then Jonah said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. He is the God who made the sea and the land. Then the men were very afraid. They asked Jonah, what terrible thing did you do? They knew Jonah was running away from the Lord because Jonah had told them. The wind and the waves of the sea were becoming much stronger. So the men said to Jonah, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down? Jonah said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then it will calm down. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come on you. Instead, the men tried to row the ship back to land, but they could not. The wind and the waves of the sea were becoming much stronger. So the men cried to the Lord, Lord, please don't let us die because of taking this man's life. Please don't think we are guilty of killing an innocent man. Lord, you have caused all this to happen. You wanted it this way. Then the men picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. So the sea became calm. Then they began to fear the Lord very much. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord. They also made promises to him. And the Lord caused a very big fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before we go any further, there are two really important things we need to get into our minds as we begin to get us uh, to understand this story a little bit better. Hopefully you've got your Bibles with you. If you haven't, press pause right now. Uh, Run off and find your Bible. Come back, find Jonah chapter one and then press play. Well, hopefully you have Jonah chapter one open in front of you. And as I said, there are two really important things we need to discover as we look at this passage together. If you look at verse nine, you'll see that Jonah was a Hebrew. That means he was Jewish, a member of God's chosen people. God had made great promises to their ancestor, Abraham. God had rescued them from Israel, uh, from slavery in Egypt. God had led them safely through the Red Sea. God had revealed himself to them by giving them the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And God had blessed them with a special place called the Promised Land. Everyone outside of God's chosen people, well, they were called Gentiles. And they didn't have the same access to God that the Jewish people did. Then if you look at verses 1 and 2, you'll see that Jonah was a prophet. That is, the word of the Lord came to him, and his job was to pass it on to those around him, to both Jews and, in this case, Gentiles. So Jonah was a Hebrew, and he was a prophet. With that in mind, what happens first in this chapter? Well, first of all, we see that Jonah runs. He's given a word of God from God, isn't he, to go and preach against the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, one of the great superpowers of the day. As a nation, they had a reputation for being pretty nasty. When they invaded other countries, they rarely took people as prisoners. They simply destroyed everything. And on top of that, they were the number one enemies of the Jewish people. Jonah is told to go and tell the people in Nineveh that God is going to judge them because of their evil behaviour, because of their wickedness. But what is Jonah's response? Do you see it there in verse 3? He scarpers, doesn't he? he? He runs for it. We're not told straight away why Jonah does this, but there are certain explanations that we can rule out. It's not that Jonah was a coward. He's not frightened to go and speak of God's judgment in Nineveh. Now, if you look to verse 12, you'll see that Jonah is ready to be thrown into the raging sea. Not the actions of someone who is scared or someone who is a coward. It's not fear that stops Jonah from going to Nineveh. And it's not that Jonah didn't think that God couldn't do what he'd promised. He doesn't doubt God's word or God's power. Verse 9 reminds us that Jonah knows that the Lord is the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. So although verse 3 might look like the actions of someone who is either a coward or doubts God's word or God's power, that's not the case. And I'm afraid to say we're going to have to wait till later in the book to find out exactly what Jonah's motives are here. But for now, let's focus on his response. Notice Jonah doesn't argue with God. Jonah doesn't complain, not at this point anyway. No, Jonah simply disobeys. He's told to go east to Nineveh, but instead he heads west to Tarshish. He goes in completely the opposite direction to where he's supposed to be going. It's a little bit like somebody asking you to go to Land's End and you jump in the car with your your family and your friends. But instead of heading towards Cornwall, you instead head towards the north of England and then Scotland and eventually to John O'Groats. Completely in the wrong direction. Now, Jonah's doing this because it seems he's trying to get away from God, to get away from what God has asked him to do. But that is a pointless task. Does anybody enjoy playing hide and seek? It's a good game, isn't it? Do you enjoy playing it at home? Well, sometimes when you play hide and seek with little children, they don't always close their eyes when they count. 
Sometimes they uh, keep them open behind their fingers and watch where you're going, which makes hiding pretty difficult. Well, imagine for a moment you are playing hide and seek with someone who not only keeps their eyes open, but follows you wherever you go as you go and try to find somewhere to hide. It would be pointless, wouldn't it? What a silly game to try and play. Well, Jonah's trying to run away from God and what God has commanded him to do. But again, it is pointless. In Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10, the author makes it abundantly clear that fleeing from God is impossible. In the psalm, it says this. Where can I go to get away from your spirit? Where can I run from you? If I go up to the skies, you are there. If I lie down where the dead are, you are there. If I rise with the sun in the east and settle in the west beyond the sea, even there you would guide me. With your right hand, you would hold me. Here in Jonah chapter 1, the idea of fleeing from God isn't that Jonah is necessarily physically trying to get away from God. He's not thinking if I just move to another country, God will forget all about it. Instead, it's a relational thing. Jonah knows he can't physically get away from God, so he tries to break that relationship with God. He wants to forget God and forget God's claim on his life, even though God made him. And he wants to forget what God has called him to do. In many ways, Jonah is a bit like each one of us. You see, we too are guilty of forgetting God and his claim on our lives, even though he created each one of us. We'd rather do things our own way without worrying about God. We might be very nice people, always ready to help others, but we're not interested in God, thanks. We might even believe, well, if I don't think about God, perhaps he'll just go away. And even as Christians, we can be guilty of ignoring God's call on our lives because we know it will be costly. It might be difficult. It might mean changing our priorities completely. And there are certain areas of our lives where we just want to keep to ourselves, thanks. But this opening chapter of Jonah tells us how absurd that idea is. We can't just ignore God and think that if we do so, he will somehow disappear or his call on our life will go away. Remember, the Lord is the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. As we'll see in the very next ch chapter, Jonah comes to realise how foolish he's been and his need to say sorry to God. If you stop and look on last week, perhaps even think about this morning, maybe like me, you realise that you need to say sorry to God too. Well, we're going to do that together now in a short prayer of confession. And if you'd like to make this prayer your own prayer, then please do join in with the words in bold type. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. May the God of love bring us back to himself. Forgive us our sins and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the New Testament, in 1 John, we're told that if we confess our sins, if we say sorry to God for those wrong things we've done, he is faithful and just 
and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, where we are faithless, God is faithful. Faithful to his promises and faithful to his people. We're going to sing a song that reminds us of that, that through all through history, uh, God is a God who is faithful. And so we can trust and rely on him. Let's sing together now. Noah built the most enormous boat That kept the birds and animals afloat The Lord was good, the Lord was strong And Noah lived his life for him Moses led his people through the sea Taking them away from slavery The Lord was good was strong and Moses lived his life for him. seen that Jonah runs when he gets his command from God. Second in chapter one we see that God responds. If you have a little look down at the passage you'll see there in verse four that God sends a great wind on the sea to bring about a violent storm. The sailors are petrified, so so scared. They begin to throw the cargo over the side of the boat and they call out to their own gods pleading for help and an end to the storm. But it doesn't work. Jonah, on the other hand, well, he's asleep in the boat. And the captain has to go and wake him, even though this storm is raging all around. They ask Jonah to call on his God. And then they cast lots to try and work out who is to blame for bringing this calamity on their boat and their journey. Well, surprise, surprise, or not, Jonah is the one the lots fall on. And the sailors say to him, well, what have you done? Which God do you follow? What's going on? And Jonah tells them that he uh, obeys and trusts and follows 
the Lord God, the God of heaven, who made the land and the sea. And it's at this moment that we get a kind of, wait, what? Moment. You see, the sailors, in some ways, can't quite believe what they're hearing. Jonah has just told them that he follows the God who is responsible for bringing this storm about, for sending the storm on the sea. And the sailors say to him, well, if you believe in the God that is able to do all of this, then why on earth are you running from him? What have you done, Jonah? The sailors recognise that Jonah's beliefs don't match up with his actions. He says that he obeys and follows and trusts the God of heaven. And yet his actions show nothing but disobedience. Well, let me ask you, as a Christian, does your life match with your beliefs? It's an important question that we need to ask ourselves regularly because often we're quick to say that God is the most important person in our lives and yet we live as if we are the most important person in our lives. We say that relationship with God really matters and yet we spend so little time reading our Bibles and praying. The Bible says let your yes be yes and your no be no but so easy we tell Little lies may be big lies. We know some of the fruit of the Spirit is patience, kindness and goodness, but we're not very good at being patient with our little brother or sister. And we're not very kind at sharing with others in our bubble or our class at school. And actually, even as grown-ups, we can often not be very gentle in our words towards one another. As Christians, do our lives, our actions match up with our beliefs. I think this is a real challenge for all of us, whether we are young or old or somewhere in between. God wants us to obey him and our actions, our attitudes, our very lives should show that. It's a challenge to us all, isn't it? Well, as we go back to the passage, we'll see that Jonah is not ignorant of who has brought about this storm. He knows that God has brought the storm. He knows that God has controlled the casting of the lot, so it ends up falling on him. And he knows when the sailors ask him, well, what do we do next? The only answer is to throw him overboard into the ocean. Now, in the Bible, we find out that the Israelites aren't really a seafaring nation. They're not known for their swimming skills. So that, combined with this awful storm, means that if the sailors throw Jonah overboard, there's probably only one outcome. He's going to drown. And that's why they try their best to row their way out of the storm, to get back to land. But they soon realise that that's not going to work. There's nothing they can do but cast Jonah into the sea. And the moment they do it, the sea is calm. Look what happens next. These sailors who'd spent all of their time crying out to their own gods now cry out to the true God, to Jonah's God. We're told in the verses, aren't we, that they fear the Lord. They make sacrifice to him and vows and, and promises to God. They turn from their idols to follow the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. God responds with the storm, but his response doesn't end there. Finally, we also see that God rescues. How does God deal with Jonah? Well, we saw at the very beginning, God gave his instruction to Jonah, that Jonah disobeys and runs away. And we recognise, don't we, in our own lives, that sometimes that sounds a little bit like us. We're quick to disobey and do our own thing rather than follow God. But for Jonah, this meant the storm of verse 4. The storm was that judgment against Jonah and his disobedience. And that shows us that God really cares about our actions and our attitudes. It's not that Jonah's disobedience doesn't matter. And it's no different for us today. Our sin matters. God cares about our disobedience and our refusal to follow him. Jonah was thrown into the sea. He was cast into the waters. And our sin means that we deserve 
to be cast away from God. But God is a rescuer. As Jonah hit the water and began to sink, he probably thought, well, that's it, folks. Remember, Jonah had no swimming badges and left alone in the sea, he would surely drown. But God is merciful. He doesn't give Jonah what he deserves. Instead, he sends this great fish to rescue Jonah from drowning. The great fish is not a punishment, but a rescue. We're told that Jonah spent three days and three nights inside this great fish. And in the coming weeks, we'll find out what happened next in this incredible story. But here we see a God who responds and a God who rescues. As I come to a close, I just want to encourage you to take a moment to think on all that we've looked at today. In just a moment, some questions will appear on the screen. Why not take a moment to think them through for yourself? Or if you're watching with family or with others, why not have a chat about those questions with uh, one another? So when they come up on the screen, do press pause. When you're ready, press play again. And we're going to sing our second song. And then after that, Tristan and Sarah are going to lead us in our prayers. Hi, good morning. Um, we're just going to pray now and we thought it would be a good idea um, if families could perhaps hold hands whilst we pray. It's just a sign of unity, togetherness and love um, and fellowship and also humility as we, as we pray to God. So let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we praise you because you are God. You've created all things, you know all things, and you see all things. Stretch out your hand, Lord, and bring heavenly changes into our lives on earth, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, your kingdom come, the ways of Jesus to be made known to us. Still in this time of lockdown, be drawing each of us closer to your presence, and help us to love you with all our heart. Almighty God, our Creator, our Father, thank you that you are a relational God, not far away, but very near and interested in our lives. Thank you for the gift of family and community, for relationships that bless and help us. Please come upon each of our households by your Spirit. Watch over and strengthen families where they're tired and under strain. Father, we ask that you'll look upon each household with mercy. Give us grace and patience in our relationships with one another, wisdom in decisions, and give your amazing peace. Lord, we just ask that you have mercy on, on our schools. Help them and give them wisdom where the children have already returned and, and be giving them wisdom as they prepare for the children and young people to go back in September. Lord, we thank you for St. Andrew's School, Lord, and we bless it in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come and dwell in that school. Bless the children who go, the teachers who teach, and fill them with love and joy and peace. Father God, we bless our government and all those that you've put in leadership. As changes are made to allow churches to regather in person, we look for your divine guidance. Father, would you help church leaders to hear and obey your voice, having confidence that you're above all things. And we lift up Andy Bowden in particular and ask that you'll equip, bless and encourage him. Refresh the Bowden family, Lord, as they serve you here so committedly. And may this be a time where the church, your body, rises up in unity to fearlessly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, prepare us now and equip us with the power of your Holy Spirit to live in a way that points to you and draws others to yourself. Mm. We cry out to you for mercy on unbelievers and we thank you that you are the God who cares for them. We plead that you'll give them a revelation of the truth of Jesus Christ and their hearts will respond in faith. Mm. Give us the boldness and opportunities to tell people about you. Mm. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we think now of the Dillinghams as well. 
We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, and answered prayer for them, that they are back together again as a family. Thank you, Lord, that you care so much for us all. Thank you, Lord, that Matt and Becky have heard your call to go, and we ask you to continue to strengthen them and their children with the heart to serve others and to go and advance your kingdom through what they do and guide them with the decisions they have to make as well. Lord, thank you for creating math. Give it all that it needs to continue and grow in Jesus' name. So let, let us pray now as Jesus taught us and say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Our Father in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be your name. name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Tristan and Sarah, thank you so much for those prayers. As we come towards the end of our service, can I remind you that we have our Zoom cafe at 11? Do uh, join us for that. Bring along a, a cup of tea or coffee, a slice of cake or your favourite biscuit, and have a chance to catch up with others from the church family. As we come to our final song, we're reminded in this great hymn of a number of things. That the Lord God is the God of heaven, who made the land and the sea, and that he calls us to follow him. He calls us to be his witnesses, to speak out his truths. Let's be those who respond faithfully to our Lord and King. Let's sing together. As we close, a final prayer of blessing. And again, please do join in with the responses if you would like to. Let's pray. Let us bless the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Blessing, honour and glory be yours, here and everywhere, now and for ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.